Hi, my name is Alex Purnomo. I'm the pastor of Dunsar Anglican Church. This is video number eight in the series on the Gospel according to Matthew. The title of this video is When God Blesses the Unexpected People. I'm focusing on Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 16. We use the word blessings in so many different ways. We say, God bless you, in our letters, our email, our conversations. Recently, millions upon millions of people were celebrating the Lunar New Year or Chinese New Year. People were wishing each other a Happy New Year, a year full of blessings such as peace, health and prosperity and so on. But what does it mean to be blessed by God? Surely, the Bible includes things such as health, wealth, prosperity and peace among God's blessings. As we've seen in the previous video in this series, when Jesus launched his public ministry, as the Messiah, the Christ. He healed all kinds of diseases and sicknesses among people. He demonstrated not only his compassion for the weak and the despised, but also his amazing power to bring God's blessings of healing and health to all who came to him. But he was not just doing healing miracles all the time. He was also teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God. The sermons of Jesus were so mind-blowing and they have been recorded for us in chapter 5 to 7 of the Gospel according to Matthew. In the introduction to his sermons, Jesus talks about blessings, but he doesn't say what they likely thought he would say. Instead, he says what seems like one contradiction after another. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted. So according to Jesus, who is blessed? Is it those who are popular, strong, healthy, and good-looking? No. Is it those who got it all together and seem to have everything they want in life? No. How about those who feel as if they were on top of the world? No. According to Jesus, God blesses the unexpected people. These statements of Jesus sound very strange, don't they? What does Jesus mean by them? That's the focus of this video. If you want to know Jesus, if you want to know the kingdom that he claims to bring, if you are considering to follow Jesus, then you need to listen to and wrestle with what Jesus has to say about who and what kind of people are considered blessed by Jesus. Because they are not what the world might expect. But what Jesus has to say has turned the world upside down. Ever since the day Jesus preached these sermons, the world has never been the same again. What does Jesus mean by these strange statements? Let us take a look at Jesus' statements in his sermon introduction in more detail. Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow, what an amazing promise! At first reading, it seems as though Jesus is laying down the entrance requirement for the kingdom. This is what you have to do to get into heaven. But wait a minute, is that what he's really doing here? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? That concept comes from the Old Testament. In the Hebrew language, the word for poor can also mean lowly or humble. Those poor in spirit are those who acknowledge that they have absolutely nothing to offer to God, that they are spiritually bankrupt, that they are not good enough for God, that they are unworthy before God. These are people who acknowledge that they are sinners and repent of their sins. Jesus is saying that the kingdom is not made up of those who are confident that they must be accepted because of their moral goodness or religious devotion. No, the kingdom is not made up of people who deserve it. Rather, it's made up of people who do not deserve it. What a stunning statement. God blesses the unexpected people. Now imagine hearing this statement for the first time. Some people might ask in their mind, says who? What authority do you have, Jesus, to say that the kingdom of God is made up of people who do not deserve it? But that's exactly it. Jesus speaks as someone who has authority over the kingdom of God. But Jesus is just getting started. He goes on to make three more statements that are quite similar or related to the first one. And they all point out our spiritual weakness. Next, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted doesn't mean that Christians can never laugh and must show a long face all the time. 
No, this statement follows naturally from the previous one. If you are poor in spirit, then you would mourn. But Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Therefore, those who mourn for their sins are the very ones whom he comforts. Many people claim that as Christians, we must always be happy and think positively without any tears and without regrets. But those people live in denial and do not understand the true nature of the kingdom. When you are on your knees, mourning for your sin, that is when you are blessed. That is when God comforts you. That is when you know His strength coming alongside to help. We mourn not just for our sins, but also the sins of others. And sometimes we mourn over so much injustice and unrighteousness and over so much indifference to Jesus. But one day, God will give us the ultimate comfort in a new heaven and new earth, when the kingdom of God will be established in its full glory, and God himself will wipe away all tears from the eyes of those who once mourn. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. Next, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Another amazing promise. This statement flows naturally from the previous two. For if you understand and feel your desperate need for God, you will not be bold, brash, and impatient. You will not rely on your own strength or power or intelligence. Rather, you will be meek. Many people think being meek is being weak, but it's not. Being meek is not being wishy-washy. It's not simply being nice and easygoing. A meek person is not necessarily indecisive or timid. Being meek means being gentle, humble, unassuming, willing to serve. And ultimately, that is how Jesus is like. Later on in chapter 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. The word for gentle can be translated as meek. Jesus says that such people will inherit the earth. Amazing! This is closely related to the promise about the kingdom of heaven. If the kingdom of heaven belongs to us, then the, the earth belongs to us too. Later on in Jesus' ministry, he made a promise that one day, when Jesus returns to rule as the King of all kings and Lord of all lords, then everyone who trusts in Him will live with God forever, and they will inherit the earth. The world keeps telling us the lie. Believe in yourself. Unleash the powers that are innate in yourself. Be self-reliant, self-assured. Be like God. Reach out, take and eat the fruit of that forbidden tree. But Jesus says that God's kingdom come not to the strong and the powerful. Rather, it comes to the meek, the gentle, and the unpretentious. What a stunning statement! God blesses the unexpected people, people who know that everything we have, everything we can do, is from God, and that without God, we are nothing, and we can do nothing. Next, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Again, this flows naturally from the previous three statements. Those who are poor in spirit, who mourn over so much sin and injustice in their lives and in this world, and who are meek, such people would also hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness means a pattern of life that conforms to God's word. Such people would not be self-righteous because they realize they are poor in spirit and need God in all things. But they will seek to understand God's word and trust it and obey it. They will pray for their lives and the lives of others to be conformed to God's word. They will seek godly wisdom in applying God's word to different life situations. Jesus promised that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled with righteousness. Thus, most importantly, they would rely on the righteousness of Christ, who swapped places with us taking the punishment for our sins upon himself, so that his righteousness might become ours, who trust in him. 
as I said earlier, the first four statements share something in common in that they all point out our spiritual weakness. They basically say, blessed is the one who know they are spiritually poor and thus are meek before God and others. Blessed are those who know their sins, mourn over them, and long for the time when they won't be weighed down by them any longer. Do you consider yourselves blessed in those terms? It's worth reflecting on that question. How often do we find ourselves thinking that God will not bless us because we have not done very well in our spiritual life recently? Somehow we think that God is always out to mark us down, always giving us hurdles to jump over that are too high, always knowing that we will not be able to succeed. But that's not the way the Lord treats His people. He is a God of grace who opens His kingdom to the spiritually bankrupt, to those who know that they have nothing to offer, to those who humble themselves under His mighty hand. God blesses the unexpected people. The first four statements focus on our needs. The following four statements focus on our actions, actions that are pleasing to God. Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Again, this follows naturally from the previous statements. Those who are poor in spirit, meek, and seek righteousness will also be merciful to others. Jesus is not saying that the only way to obtain mercy from God is by showing mercy to others. No, mercy is not a reward for good behavior. Rather, it's a badge of membership of the kingdom. Because those who know how great God's mercy has been to them in providing entry to the kingdom, those people will demonstrate their gratitude in showing mercy to others. It is sometimes said that an alcoholic who won't admit he is an alcoholic hates all other alcoholics. Similarly, it is generally true that the sinner who won't face up to his sin hates all other sinners. But the person who has recognized his own sins and helplessness is grateful for whatever mercy is shown him and he learns to be merciful towards others. Next, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Wow, what an amazing promise! Nobody has seen God before, except perhaps Moses, the great servant of God. Who are the pure in heart? Those who are pure in heart are those who aren't motivated by self-love or human approval, but those who serve God and others with an undivided heart. It's those who do not practice their righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Have you ever selflessly helped someone? Let's say you saw someone stranded by the side of the road. You stopped and helped. How did you feel? Depressed? No. Upset? No. Blessed? Of course. God has actually designed us to find fulfillment and blessing when and only when we stop living for self. Only when we stop hungering and thirsting for wealth, position, status, fame, or whatever else our world thinks matters most. When we are pure in heart, we live not just as God designed us to be, but to live a bit like Jesus Christ himself. Ultimately, we will see God, says Jesus, because we will live eternally with him in heaven. Next, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Children of God manifest the characteristics of their Heavenly Father. We are only able to be members of the Kingdom because Jesus has chosen to make peace through the blood of His cross and so to reconcile rebels like us to Himself. He is the greatest peacemaker, the Prince of Peace. If then we are called God's sons and daughters, we are also called to be peacemakers like the ultimate Son of God. Not peace at any price, but overcoming evil with good. This follows naturally from many of the attitudes mentioned before. Being meek, gentle, hungry for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, and so on. Peacemaking includes spreading the gospel, but also other things, such as lessening tensions, seeking solutions, ensuring that communication is understood, clarifying misunderstanding, not assuming the worst of people, seeing the best in people, and working in all things for the good of others. Some people in their cynicism may say, Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall be shot at by both sides. Sadly, that's sometimes true, isn't it? That is the fallen world we live in. But the king who went to the cross to make our peace with God calls his followers to bear whatever suffering may come as we walk in his footsteps. And thinking like this prepares the way for the next statement. In verse 10, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We would like to think that we lived in a world where good is rewarded and evil punished. Sadly, in our sinful world, that's often not the case. Often, standing up for righteousness and truth doesn't make us popular. Often, having a pattern of life that conforms to God's word doesn't bring you respect and recognition, but instead persecution. But please know that here Jesus promises the same blessing as the first statement in verse 3. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we have come full circle. According to Jesus, both those poor in spirit and those persecuted because of righteousness are blessed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This shows that the poor in spirit and the persecuted are not actually different people. They are simply different aspects and experiences of the same people. And that's true for all other statements of blessings from Jesus too. They all describe the same kind of people who are considered blessed by Jesus, the kind of people who are members of his kingdom. Moreover, please note that all the blessings promised in Jesus' statements so far are closely related to each other anyway. Belonging to the kingdom of heaven are related to God's comfort and being filled with righteousness, being shown mercy, seeing God, and being called children of God. They are not different blessings that we can choose from. They are part of one and the same package of being part of the kingdom of God. In verse 11, Jesus goes on to elaborate his last statement. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. What a stunning statement! In the previous statement, he said that those who are persecuted because of righteousness are blessed. What does it mean to be persecuted because of righteousness? Well, here in verse 11, he explains what that means. They are those who are persecuted because of Jesus, because they seek to cultivate a pattern of life like Jesus, because they seek to imitate his character, his priorities, his likes and dislikes. Here, Jesus is making it clear that all these amazing statements he has made of God's blessings ultimately revolve around him. Moreover, Jesus puts this last statement in second person. Until now, he has been saying, blessed are those, blessed are those. But now he says, blessed are you. Why are you blessed? Jesus answers that in verse 12. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is promising a great reward in heaven for those persecuted because of him. He says, if you are persecuted because of him, you are aligning yourself with the whole heritage of God's prophets and witnesses across ages past. Rejoice, be happy over it. This shows whose side you are on. Again, can you imagine many people hearing this for the first time and thinking, says who? Who is this man who claims to know who will get to get into heaven and who will be rewarded in heaven? Who is this man who claims that whether or not we receive all the blessings of heaven and earth depends on whether or not we receive him? Who preaches like that? But here Jesus speaks as God's chosen king, as the one who has authority over the kingdom of heaven. He outlines the kind of people who are considered blessed, the kind of people who are members of his kingdom. And then Jesus goes on to explain how such people, how his disciples, must make a difference in the world. He uses two metaphors, the salt and the light. In verse 13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. What is Jesus saying here? He is saying that his people, the members of God's kingdom, are like salt. Its saltiness makes salt good and useful for various purposes. In other words, those who are poor in spirit, mournful over sin, meek, 
hungry and thirsty for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, and persecuted because of Jesus. That kind of people make a difference to the world because of who they are. Even if the world opposes them, they are good for the world. But Jesus also seems to point out, perhaps rather gently, what we can clearly see in the history of God's people, the Israelites in the Old Testament, namely that they have failed to be the salt of the earth. Because of their failures, they were no longer good for anything, and they actually deserve God's judgment. The good news is that Jesus has come to treat his people better than they deserve. He has come to show his grace and to succeed where they have failed. Jesus also compares his people by using the metaphor of light. In verse 14, he says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying that his people, the members of God's kingdom, are like light. They cannot be hidden. Those who are poor in spirit, mournful over sin, meek, hungry and thirsty for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemaker, and persecuted because of Jesus, that kind of people will stake out and attract attention in the world, even if that attention sometimes means opposition and persecution. But again, they are good for the world because they are there for a purpose, which is to witness to their Father in heaven, so that people might see their good deeds and glorify their Father in heaven. If you were to meet Jesus today, do you think that he would consider you blessed? If not, what are you going to do about it? I would strongly encourage you to consider Jesus' words carefully, because they determine your eternity. If you have questions, please write them in the comments below. If you are already a member of God's kingdom, well, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Let's consider ourselves blessed for being poor in spirit, blessed for being mournful over sin, blessed for being meek, blessed for being hungry and thirsty for righteousness, blessed for being merciful, blessed for being pure in heart, blessed for being peacemakers, and blessed for being persecuted because of Jesus. Let's keep trusting in Jesus and doing good so that our Father in heaven might be glorified, because God blesses the unexpected people. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe button and share it with other people so that they can also benefit from it. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.